Evening, everybody. My name is David Goodhart. I'm from Policy Exchange. I head the, dem the demography unit, um, which is just me, actually. I am the demography unit. Um, um, but I'm very, very pleased to, um, to be introducing this event tonight. Um, Jonathan Haidt, who uh, obviously all of you will know, I think is, uh, has become in, in the last few years one of the most significant academics working in the English-speaking world. His book that I know some of you have read, um, The Righteous Mind, was highly influential on both sides of the Atlantic. And um, I think it's fair to say it converted many liberals into better liberals, and probably some of them into conservatives as well. Um, more recently, John has been focusing on issues close to home in US higher education, uh, the issue that we're particularly going to concentrate on tonight, the issue of uh, the political monoculture among academics. Um, but also he's been uh, involved in the debates about the so-called safety culture, safetyism among students. Um, and uh, Jonathan's response to the first of these two issues was to set up something called the Heterodox Academy in the US, um, which um, I mean, it'll, it will probably come up uh, later in the evening, but I, I, it's, as far as I understand it, the function of the Heterodox Academy is to both monitor levels of, um, of political bias and also lobby against um, the, the political monoculture. Um, but his response to the, the second issue in US higher education has been to write his latest book, The Coddling of the American Mind, uh, which is being sold um, at the back of the room. Um, and I'm sure Jonathan will sign uh, copies later. Um, a book he wrote, by the way, with Greg Lukianoff, um, which has um, been a, a, a very important, I think, pulling together of the, the arguments in the, um, uh, about the current state of political debate in US higher education. Anyway, we're going to debate these issues, um, how serious they are, um, how does the situation in the US compare to the situation here in the UK, and, and I think and I hope we will also be looking at the extent to which the, our politics and indeed our whole society is going to be changed as the current generation of students takes over our institutions. Perhaps rather a terrifying thought. Um, but anyway, the, um, the running order tonight is going to be, um, Jonathan is going to um, do a slideshow for about 15, 20 minutes, I think. Um, we then got um, four people who are going to respond rather briefly, five, seven minutes. Um, and in this order, Joanna Williams from this parish, um, who many of you know, um, author, most relevantly for tonight, of Academic Freedom in an Age of Conformity. Um, then Ken MacDonald is going to speak. Uh, there's Ken. Um, Ken is a former director of public prosecutions. Uh, he's now warden of Wadham College in Oxford and has been involved in free speech issues at Oxford University. Uh, then John Wilson is going to speak, who is a historian of British India at King's College. And finally, Eric Kaufman. Um, last but not least, uh, Eric, who's a professor of political science at Birkbeck College and author most recently of a controversial book called White Shift about the, what, the consequences of the disappearance of ethnic majorities in Western countries, which is also for sale at the back of the room. Um, so without more ado, um, welcome Jonathan to, to Policy Exchange and to the stage. Um, I, will, I will come back after everybody has had their go. Well, after Jonathan's slideshow, this will disappear to reveal these four people sitting here, I hope. Um, and um, what, what I might do, actually, is get you to respond briefly to what they have said, and then we will open it up to the rest of you. Thanks very much. Okay. Well, thank you so much, David. Thanks for, for inviting me, for setting, for setting this up. Um, it, it's sometimes said that uh, the 21st century will be the century of robotics or 
AI or genetics or something like that. Uh, but I, I disagree. I think the 21st century is going to be the century of social science uh, because uh, there is a there's a chance that Western liberal democracies will fail. Some of them may fail. Uh, we're facing a variety of problems that we don't understand. We're not really able to make good policy um, because of uh, not because the policy issues are so hard, but because human beings are so hard. Um, it's absolutely vital that we understand human nature, that we understand society, that we understand sociology, and we're doing a generally bad job of it on certain topics. Um, my view is that it is absolutely vital that we get the universities working, that the social sciences in particular, um, if we don't understand issues like immigration and we do immigration badly, uh, it can lead to disastrous results in, uh, as might happen in many nations. <clears throat> Um, and so I've been thinking about this for a long time, about the difficulty of doing good research on controversial topics, and every now and then I come across somebody who seems to really get it, somebody who seems to really understand uh, the, the complexity of issues and how they drive us insane sometimes, how we're unable to think about certain topics, almost as though they're radioactive. Uh, and so David's, David's early writing and his, and his book, The Road to Somewhere, is one of those cases, someone who gets it. And so David and I have long had, had really good discussions. Uh, and as we've been having those discussions, uh, political polarization has been increasing in my country and in Britain, making it even harder to have those discussions. Uh, and at first I thought this was just a sort of a, an academic issue for the faculty. Uh, but now it's become clear that no, it's, it's much bigger, it's much broader. We still don't fully understand what's going on, but big changes are happening. Uh, the book that I'll be telling you about tonight, I thought it would be worth it if we're all interested in higher education, we're all interested in good public policy. I thought it would be uh, good in this forum for me to start with about a 20 minute overview. I can summarize sort of the, the main points of the book and prepare us for a discussion of the implications for higher ed. Um, so I'll just go ahead and do that, and uh, um, uh, I hope that will then give us plenty to talk about. <clears throat> as you'll see, or as I'll show in the talk, uh, these things happening, these bizarre things that you've seen videos of happening in the United States, um, uh, when they were happening, it wasn't clear whether they were uniquely American or whether they were going to hit everywhere else just a year or two later. And it now appears that while there are differences between our countries, and some of the trends are not as bad here, it does appear that every trend, every strange new thing that's happening on campuses in the United States is happening here too now, just a year or two, you're a year or two behind on most. No platform that you guys kind of invented, so you had that way before we did. But the other things, I think, are uniquely American, or you know, made in the USA. So. <clears throat> In briefest terms, the story of the book is that my friend and co-author Greg Lukianoff, he's the president of the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, uh, he's prone to depression. And in tw 2007, uh, he had the most serious depression of his life. He very nearly killed himself. He was making plans. Uh, and at the last minute, he lost his nerve and checked himself into a hospital. After he was released, he learned how to do cognitive behavioral therapy. In CBT, you learn the distortions that people are prone to, catastrophizing, black and white thinking, things like that. You learn to stop doing that. So uh, Greg recovers. He's still running fire. <clears throat> and then in 2013, 2014, in that academic year, for the first time, he finds that it's not administrators pushing back on speech and trying to restrict it. It's students. And students are saying, protect us from this. That's bad. That's dangerous. And it was this new language of harm, of trauma, of safety. Words are dangerous. Ideas are either safe or dangerous. Not right or wrong, safe or dangerous. So he's very confused by this. The justifications they use are exactly the kinds of reasons he learned to not use in CBT. So he comes to talk to me, because uh, he liked my book, The Happiness Hypothesis, where I talked about CBT. And I thought his insight was fantastic, that this new way of thinking would actually make students depressed. And so it was my job. We wrote it up uh, as an essay for The Atlantic. And it was my job to survey the, the, uh, um, the health surveys and try to find evidence that, in fact, depression and anxiety were increasing. And in 2014, 2015, I could not find that evidence. There were lots of anecdotes, but there was no national survey data showing a rise in depression and anxiety in 2015. All right, so we say, well, you know, maybe it's just happening on some campuses. So we published the article. 
the things that were going on around that time were a rise in disinvitations of speakers uh, that Fire was recording. Um, the first note mentions of trigger warnings. The New Republic and the New York Times began writing about students requesting trigger warnings if some text that could be, uh, uh, that has uh, um, offensive material or say if it, uh, a Greek myth that includes a story of rape, um, students need to be warned about this. Um, the first story is about safe spaces, students requesting safe spaces if a talk was going to happen on campus that they didn't have to go to, but they were afraid that the talk might happen. Um, and professors beginning to say things like, I'm a liberal professor and my liberal students terrify me. So all of this comes from out of nowhere. There was none of this, none of this in 2013 until the very end, the first hints of it are the end of 2013. It's really 2014, 2015 that this stuff really is picking up. Again, from out of nowhere, we were all surprised. We couldn't make sense of it. But I thought Greg had a very good diagnosis. So we published our article in August of 2015. A lot of people say that we're cherry picking, that we're just responding to anecdotes. Where's the data? Um, well, in uh, Halloween, just a few months later, all hell breaks loose. It begins at Yale with protests student protests um, over an email guiding students on what to wear, and then a counter email saying, wait a second, maybe students should think for themselves. That counter email launches a wave of, of protests. Uh, students submit uh, demands to Peter Salovey, the president of Yale. Now, if you're the president of a major university and the students give you an ultimatum, they say, you have seven days, Mr. President, to meet our demands. What would you do if you were the president? Would you say, OK, OK, I'll meet them. Just, OK, give me the seven days. And that's basically what happened. Um, so, he met, so he met as many of their demands as he could. And that was the day then that it goes all over the country. Once the students saw, wow, all you have to do is make a set of demands to your university president, and he will meet them. So then in uh, 80 or more schools, similar ultimata are given to university presidents. And many of the, most of them seem to try to meet those demands for reforms that, in my opinion, would make uh, racial tensions much higher would make the higher education environment much worse. Um, so it begins as a series of, of uh, racial protests or protests over racial issues and issues of discrimination, marginalization, but it extends to almost everything. So food in the dining hall is cultural appropriation. Uh, speakers such as Miley Yiannopoulos should not just be protested but violently protested. Now here we don't know how many Berkeley students were involved. Um, but there was, but they were, some of them were involved, uh, as well as local residents. And so this meme started going around the internet, UC Berkeley during the free speech movement, and UC Berkeley today about speech. Um, again, there has not been much violence, but there have been several cases of very clear direct violence directed against speakers, especially at Middlebury College in Vermont. Uh, when Charles Murray tried to speak, he was shouted down, and then later students attacked him and the uh, political science professor who was escorting him, and she was injured possibly permanently. Um, students at Reed College in Oregon brought their protests into the class, a Western civilization class they said was too white, it didn't have enough non-white authors. Um, and so for a year they protested in class and trying to disrupt the class. Again, the leadership tends not to do anything, the leadership tends to be afraid to stand up. Um, again, protests bring into the classroom, if the students are not happy with the decision, it's their right to protest. Um, in, in law schools as well. So to summarize the puzzle, um, out of nowhere, these terms that nobody had heard of practically in 2013, suddenly by 2015, they're all over the place. Safe spaces, trigger warnings, microaggressions, bias response teams, the idea that uh, America and every place else is a matrix of oppression, a call out culture. Um, the, the, I can summarize it like this, students, again, this is not everywhere, this is not in most schools. But in most elite schools, especially in the Northeast and the West Coast, you find this culture where some students um, think that they are fragile, students are fragile, and they're living in a dangerous and hostile country, which, OK, you could debate that, um, but a dangerous and hostile university. Now, that tends to happen in the most progressive, left-leaning, anti-racist universities, but these are seen as so hostile uh, that students need protection, they need, these places need to be reformed. So that's what happened, that's what this book is about. Um, we wrote it as a kind of a social science detective story. It was great fun to write because there is no simple explanation. There's not, it's not like, oh, social media, that's what caused it. Um, in the book, the middle section, we, have, we go through six, we have six chapters describing six causal threads. I won't go through them tonight, I'll just do one. The one most relevant to us is the political polarization, the rising political polarization of the country at the same time as the faculty are becoming much more politically homogeneous. So that's the one I'll talk about tonight. <clears throat> but other ones include 
um, a rising levels of anxiety and depression, which I'll mention, par changes in parenting. Uh, uh, Frank Ferrady wrote a book on this, Paranoid Parenting, the decline of free play, the growth of bureaucracy in universities, and changing ideas about social justice. So it's a very complicated but I think interesting story about why it came out of nowhere. Well, in fact, the roots go back, six different threads go back to the 1990s for the most part. The book is organized around three great untruths. These are ideas so bad that if any young person can be, com uh, can be persuaded to believe them, we can almost guarantee that this person will not be successful in life. Um, so what doesn't kill you makes you weaker. Always trust your feelings. And life is a battle between good people and evil people. If, if you believe that, you're in big trouble. I'll just very briefly do one because I feel like I need to do this everywhere I talk, especially here in Britain, because I think you don't know this yet. Um, as I said, in 2015, we didn't know that we were having an epidemic of depression and anxiety. Uh, it was only in 2017 that the data was clear uh, because it takes a couple years before from, the, from the event to the reporting. And it turns out you have that in Britain, too. You're just a year or two behind us. So very briefly, um, of course, you know the famous dictum from Nietzsche, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger because People are anti-fragile. We actually need stress, tension, adversity in order to develop our abilities. In the United States, we decided, beginning in the late 1980s, but especially in the 1990s, we decided that we needed to protect our children from harm, um, all kinds of harm, including emotional harm. We now have the phrase emotional safety. Are you emotionally safe, meaning are you not upset? Well, can you imagine going through your whole childhood being protected from being upset, and then you're sent off to college? Um, it would be very difficult to be an adult if you've been overprotected. But once you start overprotecting, you kind of have to keep doing it. And so uh, helicopter parenting we talk a lot about. Uh, and if you helicopter parent your kid all the way to college, well, then you have to be there for them in college to help them through rough spots and to help them find a job and to help them keep the job. And so it never ends. Basically, the job of a parent is to work him or herself out of a job and we forgot that in my country. <clears throat> and this, we believe, is the result. Now, this is the result of many things. We don't know exactly what's causing this. But what this graph shows is nationally representative data, federal government data. This is the percentage of teenage boys and girls who uh, report a major depressive episode in the last year. And that is, they answered true to five out of nine symptoms of major depression. That's a standard definition of having a major depressive episode. And what you see, you can't read the numbers on the bottom, but it's, I think, 2004 or so is where that particular graph starts. The millennials, born between 1982 and 1994, the millennials were fairly stable. That's before that box of data. The, but once the millennials are leaving the data set and they're replaced by iGen, the internet generation, or Gen Z, Gen Z is, I think, the term that has dominated. So once Gen Z comes into the picture, the boys do go up in, in depression. That is a, a significant rise as a percentage. But as you can see, the increase for girls is gigantic, a very, very large increase, uh, about roughly 40%, I believe, in the rate. So that roughly one in five American girls now reports that she has had a major depression um, in the last year. Um, this is not just that they're comfortable reporting it. This is not just self-report stuff. This is hard data on hospital admissions. So um, young uh, teenage girls, much more than teenage boys, sometimes cut themselves uh, so badly they have to be hospitalized. It's an anxiety. It's a related to anxiety. And so these are the hospital admission rates, uh, the, the number out of 100,000 in any given year that have cut themselves to the point where they deliberately harmed themselves to the point where they have to be hospitalized. And what you see is on the top line is the girls age 15 to 19, they're the ones who have the highest rate. Um, so far, the data ends at 2009. And as you can see, there's no real trend. Um, going across the years, it's not really rising. But as soon as uh, Gen Z comes into the picture, look what happens. Note that the bar in the middle is, girl, is young women in their 20s. Those are millennials. No change. The millennials are not affected. They're not cutting themselves more. Um, it's the younger girls who are doing it. It's those born after 1995. Um, the youngest girls, ages 11 to 14, used to do it very, it was very rare for girls 11, 14 to cut themselves. Uh, but their increase is 180%. The rate is up 180% over the last 10 years. Um, the suicide rate shows the exact same thing. Now here, it is both boys and girls. Um, girls make more uh, suicide attempts, but boys make more completed suicides because they tend to use guns, which we have a lot of in my country, guns or tall buildings. And so the male suicide rate is higher. Um, it's bounced around, but it is up as soon as iGen comes, or Gen Z comes into the picture. The male rate is up 25% in the last 10 years over the first decade of this century. The female rate is up 70%. 
70% more teenage girls now kill themselves than was happening 10 years ago. This is the highest rate ever recorded. Um, so again, the highest rate ever recorded. What about the UK? Uh, when we were writing the book, we did find some hints of data about the UK. But again, you're a year or two behind us. So when I looked uh, over the last month or two, I found a lot more. Here's what's going on in your country. <clears throat> Surveys clearly show a decline in happiness among girls, teenage girls. Um, you might think, well, okay, fine, that's just self-report. This generation might be more comfortable talking about it. What about suicide? Well, your suicide rate has been going down steadily for 40 years. Congratulations, Britain. Your overall suicide rate for men and women is down. It's at historically low levels. That's great except for teenage girls. Teenage girls are at the highest rate ever recorded. Your teenage girls are killing themselves more often. Um, by one measure that I found, it's up 60%. Your suicide rate for teenage girls is up 60% compared to 10 years ago. Um, Self-harm, same thing. This is a study in the British Medical Journal. The, the, the faint line you can barely see at the bottom is the boys, teenage boys in Britain, rarely cut themselves, and that has not changed. But your girls show the exact same pattern as ours, stable until around 2010, 2011, and then it shoots up. OK, and now for, well, let me just say, because you're all wondering, why? Why the girls, right? Were you wondering that? Um, the, we don't know for sure, but the best explanation is that social media, uh, so uh, Facebook opens up to the world in 2006, but most teenagers aren't on it. iPhone comes out in 2007, but it's very expensive. Few teenagers have one. By 2010 and 11, we're reaching the 50% point. By 2012, most teenagers have an iPhone or smartphone and social media. Um, when boys get an iPhone, what do they do? They play war games. They play video games. And it turns out video games are actually not that bad for boys. There's a lot of debate about it, but it's not devastating. My son plays video games. I, I put limits on hours and all of that. But largely, it's cooperative fun games where he and his friends roam around beautiful imaginary worlds killing people. Um, <laughs> but it's, you know, it's teamwork. It's fun. They're communicating. Um, <clears throat> um, boys' aggression is physical, so iPhones don't change it. Girls, on the other hand, what are they doing? They're not playing video games. They're composing selfies, putting on filters to make themselves look more beautiful. Their friends see it. Oh my god, she's more beautiful than me. She's going to that party. I'm not. Um, girls' aggression is relational. They damage each other's relationships. It used to be that when a girl came home from school, she couldn't be bullied. Now she can never escape. So in a variety of ways, social media and iPhones have transformed the social life of girls in very negative ways while having relatively minimal effects on the social life of boys. And now for something completely different. Set all of that aside. That's one line of work that I've done. In a totally unrelated line, I was invited to give a talk in 2011 on the future of social psychology. And I pointed out that we have almost no political diversity. Um, everyone I, I could think of was on the, on the left. I used four techniques to find a conservative social psychologist. One of them worked. I found one. Um, so that was 2011. I gave a talk on this and I explained not like, oh, this is unfair. My talk was entirely, given what we do, given the necessity of being challenged, this is not good for our science. This will reduce the quality of our research at a time when we really need good research on race, gender, inequality, poverty, immigrant, all these things. We need really good research, and we might not get it, I argued. I was joined by several other social psychologists. We published this paper. I won't go through the claims. You can find the paper online. Um, but the point is uh, that site we show that psychology once had a lot of political diversity, but now it has essentially none. Uh, we show that this lack of diversity undermines the scientific validity of our work in certain domains, not, not in most places, but in politicized topics it does. Uh, we, ex we argued that increased diversity would improve the science, and we, ex we thought, uh, we made the argument that the underrepresentation of non-leftists, non-liberals, um, resulted from a combination of factors, mostly self-selection, mostly not discrimination, but we s ha had evidence that there is some discrimination. Um, I won't go through the reasons. It's kind of obvious, confirmation bias being the main one. We're all really, really good at confirming what we believe, and that's the magic of a university, is that you make your claim, and somebody out there doesn't share your confirmation bias. They really want to disprove what you're saying. And if they work hard at it, we all get smarter. We find the truth. Minority influence. Groups are subject to groupthink. If you have dissenting minorities, it makes the group think better. 
So this is all kind of obvious. But look at the data. This is what we found by putting, to, uh, putting together a variety of data sets. Well, this one is actually from Sam Abrams, a political scientist. This is nationally representative data of professors. What this shows is the top line is professors in the United States who self-identify as on the left or liberal. Uh, and the red line is conservative. So it was two to one in, um, in 1996. Uh, the the um, the line in the middle is moderates. And as you see, uh, so two to one is fine. You don't need balance. You just need the certainty that someone will challenge you. Um, but uh, as the greatest generation ages out and the baby boomers take over, that's one of the reasons, the ratio becomes five to one by 2011. Now that's all professors, including the dental school, the agriculture school, the engineering school, where there are a fair number of Republicans or conservatives. If we look at the core domains of this humanities and social sciences, it's much, much different or much larger. This is my own field, psychology. We put together all the existing studies of the politics of the professoriate. What we found is that whether you look at left, right, or Republican, Democrat, it was between two to one or four to one throughout the 20th century, left, right. Uh, more, more people on the left than the right. But again, that's fine. I don't care about balance. I care about the certainty of disconfirmation. But uh, beginning, but after the mid-90s, look what happens. It goes up and up and up, 14 to 1 by 2012. And then we got a new data point a year and a half ago. 17 to 1 is our latest data point, 17 to 1. And again, I know the one guy. <laughs> um, there is actually some data on um, the British Academy. So Noah Carl, um, I, do any of you know him? I, I, we, should have been, we should have invited him. Um, so Noah Carl uh, put out, uh, 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 was able to find some data, and you see the same trend there. Um, uh, now this, I believe, is by political party. This is labor versus uh, conservatives. And so there have been more labor, and that goes back. I can't see what the first year is. It's in the 90s, I think. But the same, basically the same pattern, um, that over time, especially in the 21st century, the left goes up, the right goes down. Now, why does this matter? It matters for the quality of science. But now imagine universities in a country in which left and right don't particularly like each other, and then you crank up the hatred. Now you make left and right hate each other. So this is federal or national, I'm sorry, this is American National Election Survey. What do you think about your own party? What do you think about the other party? And what you see there, the blue and red lines on the top are what Democrats and Republicans think about their own party. They like their own party on a scale of 0 to 100, and it hasn't changed since the 1970s. The two bottom lines are what do you think about the other party? And as you see, they like the other party less. But it's only in the 40s. It's not 0. They dislike the other party, but not intensely in the 1970s and 80s and all the way into the 90s. It's only in the 21st century that those numbers plummet. And this is before Trump. Now the numbers would be down somewhere in the floor below us. So the point is, um, when you have an increasingly politically homogeneous professoriate at a time when left and right increasingly hate each other, what happens? Any dissent from the party line is more likely to be punished. That, I believe, is where we are. Again, not at all of our universities, but at the prestigious ones, at the elite ones, and especially in the Northeast and the West Coast, where most of the top universities are. So um, when we get into this situation, we no longer have the condition that John Stuart Mill told us was so important. He who knows only his own side of the case knows little of that. And American students and professors now increasingly know only their own side of the case. That's why I and several other professors, social scientists originally, and a law professor, founded Heterodox Academy. Um, our goal was to advocate for more viewpoint diversity. Um, we've created a bunch of products that we think can be helpful. The Open Mind program is a program that actually teaches students um, how to engage with ideas that are different from their own. The Campus Expression Survey is a way of measuring who is afraid of speaking about what topic and why. This is the data that you most need in this country. Um, as far as I can see from my conversations here, um, you in this country, you, you think that it's a free speech debate. And so it's a debate about free speech on college campus, and that means visiting speakers. And who gets no platform? Who gets shouted down? Is it OK to shout down? Well, that is part of the issue, yes. But I think that this is not centrally a free speech issue. I think it's centrally and fundamentally a classroom dynamics issue. That is, whether or not you get visiting speakers coming to campus, the crucial function of the university, well, there's the research function that I've talked about, but there's the education function. And that fundamentally is about the classroom. 
If students in a classroom are not free to speak up because they're afraid that something bad will happen to them if they question what someone says, then your universities are not working and are not educating. So I urge you, uh, and we, there's some members of Heterodox Academy here, we've a lot, it's an international organization, there, there are many British members. Um, I urge you to use our campus expression survey either at your university or um, there are, I've spoken to various pollsters here, do it nationally. Find out who is afraid to speak up about what topics and why. Um, raise your hand if you're a professor in any way, shape, or form. Raise your hand high. Okay, I invite you all to join Heterox Academy. I know a few of you already have. Um, we are actually one of the only politically balanced uh, organizations in higher education. We're about 20% people on the left, 20% people on the right. Most of us are centrist, libertarians, or people who don't fit in any box. So we are not a right-leaning organization. Um, I would bet that almost that very few people voted for Trump. Conservative intellectuals tend not to support Trump in my country. Um, but we are not a, 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 pol a political or left or right organization. Um, I'll, I'll skip this. Um, so the last thing I'll leave you with is a description of what the problem really looks like. This is the thing you should focus on more than shout downs. Um, this is an essay by a student at Smith College from two years ago, uh, writing in her second year. She wrote an essay called Walking on Eggshells, How Political Correctness is Changing the Campus Dynamic. And here, I guess I'm, I'm not sure I can quite read it from here. I think I can. During my first days at Smith, I witnessed countless conversations that consisted of one person telling the other that their opinion was wrong, uh, the word offensive was often used. So she describes what, you know, that people are constantly being told that they're wrong in a way that kind of puts them down. Here's the key line. I began to voice my opinion less often to avoid being berated and judged by a community that claims to represent the free expression of ideas. I learned, along with every other student, to walk on eggshells for fear that I may say something offensive. That is the social norm here. That was Smith College two years ago. The problem is now much worse, much more intense, and much stronger at many more schools. Um, so that's the question. And I hear reports from some students at British universities. I don't want to catastrophize. I don't want to exaggerate. I don't know how big the problem is here in Britain. We hear stories. You need data. We have to find out what's going on. And then you'll have a baseline to know if measures taken at universities are making things better. Um, and so that's it. I look forward to the comments and to any, any criticisms, anything I've missed, and a discussion about whether at British universities you have the same problems um, or different problems. Thank you very much. No, no, I'm going to, I'm going to stand here. Um, we do have enough. Do we have enough? Yes, we yes. do have enough. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much for that, Jonathan. Um, let's let's get straight into the to the responses. Do, Joanna, you, you want to go first? Yeah, no problem. Uh, it's the it's the mine corner. Okay, can everyone hear me? Um, so thank you very much, Jonathan. I really enjoyed your talk, and I was reading your book last week. Enjoyed <laughs> it very much indeed. I, I was reading your book last week at the same time as preparing for a talk I was going to give at um, King's College, uh, not too many miles away from here, in fact, colleague from King's sitting right next to me this evening. And then the most surreal thing happened because the day before I was scheduled to give the talk, uh, a petition that had been put up by students uh, landed in my email inbox and it was just the most perfect illustration of bang, 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 every single point that you make in your book. So, so reading the petition and reading your book in conjunction with one another, like I said, just, just became very surreal. Um, I'd like to just read a few sentences from the petition, if you'll bear with me, just because I do think it provides such a neat illustration and it perhaps answers the question that you pitched at the end there about how is this playing out in the UK at the moment. So the, the, the headline of the petition is Opposing Hate 
in King's College, London. Uh, it then begins, we the undersigned express our disappointment towards the War Studies Department for inviting Dr. Joanna Williams to speak. And this is where, in the interest of full disclosure, I guess I need to um, make clear what it was that I've done that is considered so hateful. So I'm the author of a book uh, that's called Women Versus Feminism, and, and probably the title alone was enough to... Uh, scare many students. I think there are probably two major crimes that I commit in that book. The first is to criticise the current direction of feminism and particularly the Me Too movement with its emphasis on women's fragility and, and how women are presented as being very vulnerable. I, I questioned whether that was a good thing for a good, good move, if you like, for feminism. So that's one, one heinous crime I've committed. Uh, the second heinous crime I've committed is to suggest that there is actually a link between uh, being a man, being a woman, and biology, that uh, when the doctor or the midwife announces at the moment of your birth, you know, it's a boy or it's a girl, this isn't just some random act of violence, um, <laughs> but there may actually be some kind of scientific basis to that declaration. Um, Following on from that, I did say that for uh, small rural primary schools with, with very few pupils in a time of limited resources in the education system, the um, pressure on them to start building gender neutral toilets might not actually be the most sensible way for them to spend their money. So anyway, that's the background. Now on to the petition. Uh, so me, I am, apparently she is someone who opposes women, trans and non-binary people, and their well-being and survival, including opposition to the Me Too movement and feminism. We ask you to redact her invitation, cancel the event, and publish a public apology. Uh, we publicly state our support for women, trans, and non-binary people. This step is a much-needed fight back against King's College London's complicity in and apathy towards transphobia and misogyny. And then it lists my crimes, um, arguing that provisions for trans people indoctrinates children into questioning their gender and sexuality. By stating this as being immoral, and I'm, I'm afraid I can only apologize on behalf of some of these students because sometimes the sentences are just not very grammatical and don't really make much sense. But anyway, by stating this as being immoral, she reinforces the rigidity of gender and sexuality, which in turn upholds the violent patriarchal world we live in. Not supporting LGBT plus people is violence. According to Stonewall, 83% of trans young people have experienced verbal abuse and 27% have attempted suicide. Um, supporting LGBT people is not, as she says, a waste of time and money, but a matter of basic survival. So I'll, I'll skip a little bit. Uh, not supporting women, trans and non-binary people kills, and Williams knowingly endorses this. By giving her a platform, the War Studies Department legitimizes and spreads these viewpoints and will directly or indirectly harm people, including staff and students. King's College London has a duty of care to its students and staff, and by facilitating viewpoints that harm us, it fails in that duty. And as I say, I was reading this petition alongside reading your book, wow. and it's just like every single point that you make in your book is completely uh, drawn out in this position, in, in this petition. So first of all, you get this um, sense of the students as being very fragile, seeing themselves as being very fragile and very vulnerable, and um, particularly uh, prone to being harmed by viewpoints that they disagree with. I think you also have a very clear presentation of life as a battle between good people and evil people. Uh, clearly, I'm on the side of the evil people, and they are on the side of the good people. But you notice the, to me, what seems like an exaggeration there, where, where simply to, to cr raise criticisms or raise questions is enough to have you labeled transphobic, misogynistic. Um, there's, there's no attempt to understand the nuances of an argument. Um, the always trust your feelings comes out very strongly as well. 
Uh, I think certainly I would argue some of the quotations that they draw upon have been taken very selectively and depend upon a peculiarly um, bad-willed reading of, of things that have been written. I think the other thing that comes across very, very strongly is the idea of words as violence. Um, if you look at the number of times violence and harm and suicide are used in that petition, uh, and I, I, what's interesting is that it's not just saying a, a question of, of saying the wrong words that can harm, but actually refusing to say the right words that's also seen as being capable of, of harming people. Uh, there's a real sense of catastrophism to the whole thing and a real sense of a kind of foregone conclusion that this will harm, it's been pre predetermined that this will harm people. And, and all the talk of survival and violence kind of makes you, you need to draw breath and think actually, do you know what, this is a talk at a university, um, it's not a description of a war zone. Um, but also there's this real strong entitlement to emotional safety that you describe. A king's has a duty of care, and that duty of care means that not just should the event be cancelled, but an apology should be issued too. And, and that sense of entitlement to safety, I think, comes across really, really strongly. So I was very grateful to be reading your book at the same time as this happened because I think your book really provides very nice vocabulary um, and, and a framework for us to make sense of some of these things that are going on. I think your book's also very good because it um, doesn't make the mistake of just kind of shouting snowflake and then running away because I think when you do that, you really run the risk of entrenching the them and us the, the world's against us, we're on the side of the good, you're the bad, and, and I think you don't fall into that trap. Um, but, but I do agree with the point that you were making at the end that, that what's going on in universities in the UK as well is about far more than just the no platforming. Um, the, the silent seminar, if you like, and sorry, I, I didn't point out the conclusion to last week's events. So the debate, with thanks to very, very brave people in the War Studies Department at King's College, the event went ahead. It went ahead without a hitch, not one peep at all, primarily because not one of the 144 people who signed the petition showed up. So uh, apparently the Israeli ambassador was speaking elsewhere on campus at the same time, and they all went to protest him um, because he's obviously uh, way more evil than I am. But I, I just want to raise a couple of concerns very, very quickly. I can see David looking daggers at me. Um, one concern that I have is taking the mental health crisis as a given, um, I think, runs the risk of reinforcing the idea that to be um, young and is to be mentally vulnerable, which seems to me to be a really strong perception. I think there's room for us to think far more critically and, and investigate far more critically, not take at face value this perception of a mental health crisis. Um, my, uh, when we start then recommending CBT as a way forward, I, I worry that we avoid having the political argument about, how, about why free speech is so important, not just on the university campus, uh, but everywhere in society. I think there's a risk, I'm uh, kind of use a terrible med medical metaphor here, I think there's a risk that the kind of CBT approach inoculates students for a short time, but it doesn't win the argument fundamentally as to why free speech is so important. I think free speech is never won once and for all. If we look back over the past 100, 200 years of, of political history and debate on both sides of the Atlantic, we never ever win free speech and then can just kind of go to bed happy and say, that's it, job done. We need to keep remaking this argument in new eras and in new political contexts. And I think the political context that we are fighting against today is primarily against this perception of young people um, in particular as being vulnerable, um, as, as being uh, completely emotionally fragile. I think what's important is that we recognize universities are not um, in a vacuum they are part of society, and the arguments for free speech need to be won across society as a whole. Well, I, yeah, I, I don't worry. I'm going to be quite. I'm going to be. I'm going to be quite brief. I, I, I hope. 
Yeah. <laughs> I hope we're not going to be in um, just in heated agreement. The, the evening could get a bit dull. I'd, I'd like to make a counter argument, but um, I'm struggling to think of one at the moment. I, I, what, I, what I would say is, um, is that I don't think this is a uniquely American problem. And certainly my perception in Ox in of what's going on in Oxford is the sort of incident that you describe probably could happen there. Um, but I wonder whether this is a form of, of uh, on this side of the Atlantic at the moment anyway, more a form of imitation, sort of posturing imitation. And I, and I say that because it's quite interesting that what actually happened in your case was nothing. That they, 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 they draft this rather pathetic and depressing and abysmal um, uh, petition, but nothing actually results from it. And, I, and I, my, my perception in Oxford is that there is, there is a relatively small minority of students, many of them to be found in my college, which is notorious for this kind of thing, <laughs> who would be capable of, of writing a petition like that, but it wouldn't represent any sort of mainstream in the institution. I, I think one of the things you were saying was that one of the problems in these elite US institutions is this becoming part of the mainstream, not just amongst the students, but amongst the faculty. And I, I, I'm not wanting to be complacent here, but I don't think we're there yet. We, we could be, and maybe we're just two years behind, or maybe there's something else going on um, in, in the States th that's not occurring here. And certainly in our elite universities, we seem to be less uh, troubled by this than in some other universities. So this is certainly not a thing about elite universities in the UK. I think, I think the bigger problem might be in, in some of the, the, the non-elite universities, if I can describe it that way, although I'm not sure, and I don't want to name any in particular. Let me say a little bit about mental health, because I was very interested in what you said about that. There is undoubtedly um, an epidemic, uh, a, a mental health epidemic in British universities. There is in Oxford, there is in Cambridge, it's right across the board. I, I would be slightly cautious about, in our context, um, describing that or identifying that as part of the pathology that you were describing in terms of the sort of thought processes that are going into a petition like that. I, I think there are all sorts of reasons why we might be seeing um, increases in, in mental health. There may, be, there, may be, there may be mental health problems. There may be stresses around social media. There may be all sorts of things. Part of it seems to me, from my observations in Oxford, not all of it, but part of it is the medicalization of issues that aren't really mental health issues. So I'm stressed out about my exams. Um, I have got to be given a special room. I'm not going to the examination school to do my <coughs> exams. I want the college to provide me the room. And by the way, my exams are six weeks off. I'm feeling really stressed. I want a year off. I'll do them next year. Uh, I've got a, a, a note here from my GP which says I'm too stressed to do my exams. Now, there's, a, there's an awful lot of that going on in this mental health crisis. I'm not suggesting there aren't students with mental health issues. There are. But there's an awful lot of medicalization going on. There's an awful lot of herd instinct going on. And we reward it. There is a reward for making this assertion. So I think it's more complicated than simply providing a link between that and the sort of unacceptable and cretinous behaviors that we've been considering tonight. And I, I'm, I'm going to be brief, but I, I, but, I, but, I, but, I, but I do want to say a little bit about free speech, because I don't agree with you that this is just a, a, an aspect of the problem and it's a shut, shut, shut them down problem. I think that the, the, the problem with free speech um, is that these, these, these people, these young people, don't just have a lack of respect for free speech, as we've understood it. They have a positive disrespect yes. for it. And I have heard young people argue um, in my own university, uh, not a majority of you, but I've heard the young people argue that free speech, free speech rights, are a tool of the privileged and the powerful to be used against the unprivileged and the powerless. In this yes. sense, Very the fun. free speech battles are about allowing powerful people to say uh, unacceptable things about uh, unprivileged people. And article, the First Amendment protects their right to do so. So it's a tool of power. And I've heard American faculty, actually, to my shock, absolute shock and despair, including a very senior member of the Yale Law faculty who, who I responded to in a debate in Oxford, make this argument. And, I, and I, so I think it's about more than shutting down. It's about all the other things we've been talking about. That, that um, cry of despair from, the, from the, the student at Smith University what that she was eloquently saying, people here don't understand free speech. They think that offensive speech is unacceptable. You, I mean, you, the, the courts have repeatedly said that the right to say only things which are anodyne or not offensive is not a right worth having or exercising. And you know, all well, we can quote them all. All this stuff. The whole point about the right to free speech that gives you the right to say things that other people don't want to hear. And that's what that student was saying. And I think a lot of this stuff about, about safe spaces and trigger warnings and all this, all this nonsense is about an inability to comprehend 
the importance of free expression, the importance of the free and robust expression of ideas in universities, and the absolutely essential place for rudeness and offensiveness in, in, in intellectual mm -hmm. discourse as in all other discourses. I, I think a, an awful lot of this is rooted in a, in a, in a, in a depressing failure to understand what free speech represents. And another faculty member of a, another university said to me when Timothy Garton and Ash and I were running some seminars on free speech, I was making this point, and he looked up at me and he said, that's just all enlightenment stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I must say, when I, when I went to Oxford, I'm not a professional academic, I'd never expected to hear a senior academic use the word enlightenment as a term of abuse. <laughs> and I found that profoundly depressing, and that's one of the things that we need to switch around. So um, I feel kind of my institutional life converging <laughs> upon me because um, Duane uh, talked about experience at my university and Ken is head of my old college where, oh, uh, where right. I was um, precisely one of the students you, uh, you, um, you described. Not, well, not exactly. I, I, um, Wadham was too full of kind of posh lefties and I'm, I, I'm, not particularly, I'm a lefty but not particularly posh and I found that actually quite kind of alienating. Yeah. Um, but, but, it, but, it, but I want to um, start by... Um, and, and, and I, 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 I enjoyed Jonathan's comments, and I'm going to um, be sort of impolite in two respects um, at, a, at a kind of book launch. Uh, ordinarily, one has read the book and agrees with the premise, and I haven't read the book, and I agree with some of the premise, but I've been invited to kind of be the sort of fly in the ointment, so I'm going to kind of be, be critical, as you'd expect at a, an event about this topic. So, so another... Um, let me kind of sort of uh, put you in another kind of uh, another meeting room in King's College London, um, a much more boring conversation, as well as um, kind of teaching history. Um, I'm in university middle management as vice dean education, kind of the Faculty of Arts and Humanities, and, um, and I'm going to talk about this in a bit more in a moment, but, you know, kind of one, one of the things we're, we're keen on, we're, we like, is interdisciplinarity and getting uh, people from different disciplines to talk to each other. And we're talking about the idea of, a, of an English and history undergraduate degree, uh, joint degree. Um, it didn't get anywhere. It didn't get anywhere because English, the, the English scholars and the historians could not agree about anything. They are so radically opposed in the kind of conceptual frameworks within which they view the world, within which the, the kind of the lens through which they see everything is so different that, that they couldn't agree a curriculum, they couldn't agree even the point of why they would want to cooperate. Um, and that is, for me, uh, that's the university. You know, kind of, uh, univer universities are now places of radical disagreement, radical disagreement about an extraordinary amount of stuff. Every single, single one of those um, academics who, was, who were involved in that conversation uh, voted Labour, I'm pretty certain. They all were Remainers, um, you know, kind of they were all liberals, but their academic orientation to the world, and in some ways the, their broader orientation to the world, so fundamentally different, kind of informed by their discipline, by prof their professional expertise. Um, that beyond that, they didn't have much in common. Um, and so. There are lots of different, my point is there's lots of different kinds of diversity. And when we're talking about, um, you know, kind of engaging, you know, students being at university, um, you know, kind of whether, you know, the political party that somebody votes for um, kind of is not the only kind of diversity. And, that's, um, and, that, and, that's, and I think universities in Britain actually kind of do, um, precisely because we have strong discipline, um, you know, sort of do very well in kind of, in, in retaining the kind of diversity that, of, of sort of intellectual um, uh, life. Um, so um, I think I think there, there is a free speech problem to some degree. Although I'll speak a little more in a moment about what I think that is. Um, but I but I think in terms of the kind of broader argument, um, I d you know about uh, diversity within kind of the, the perspective that exists academically within within different departments uh, within within universities. Kind of I'm not sure we're at, at the place that maybe you're describing in the United. I don't think there's the kind of homogene homogeneity of view there. I think there's kind of diversity of political view, certainly. Um, you know, uh, within, you know, th th we don't have enough conservatives, yes, but you know, there, there, is, there are very different political perspectives in British universities. Um, and I think that we, 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 we kind of, to some degree, cultivate that kind of diversity. And my own university has, um, you know, one of Britain's most important centres of kind of, you know, Hayek scholarship uh, in the Department of Political Economy. It has lots of uh, you know, quite right-wing uh, foreign policy people in war studies, as well as having Britain's most important Trotskyist intellectual. Um, you know, uh, you know, Al Alex Kalinikos. Yeah. Oh. So, so you know, um, <laughs> I have in my own department, kind of possibly the, the person who's I'm a historian of the British Empire. We, uh, I have a scholar who is probably the greatest 
you know, the person who I disagree with the most in Britain, you know, kind of, um, and, we, and we get on, more or less. Um, so that, that, that all exists, that kind of sort of, you know, broad, and I, d I don't think Kings is unique in this way. You know, kind of, we, we're, we're a, a high, higher education institutions are, are diverse, we have to be, because otherwise we lose the, the sense of the specificity and the importance of, and the individuality of what we do. Um, and I think, um, so I think that, I, but I think there are, I think there are, there are, there are some, some problems, and I'm going to briefly talk about what they are and I think there are, but I also think that we as universities are actually doing quite a lot to, to, to put them to, to, to improve them to make things um, better um, I think there is I think there is a there is a, a, a free speech problem but I think in some degree some to some degree that's that's a um, that's a problem that has to do with the culture <coughs> of if you like part of my own my political tribe the left um, and I think there is a problem a really serious problem in the British left in the left in the United States about how to argue and how to debate um, and I think that's, and I think that exists in social media. It exists kind of you know across the board. Um, it's got very little to do with universities. It's something that exists outside of those, those universities. Kind of, um, you know, it's uh, it's 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 about a certain a certain kind of. Um, you know, it, it's about many of the things you're talking about. It's the politics of victimhood. It's about you know kind of, uh, you know, the idea the idea of. Uh, you know, kind of pointing to kind of forms of elite privilege before having the conversation. It's you know, kind of it's about not taking seriously complicated forms of structural, economic. Uh, um, I'm, uh, maybe I'm about to steal your, the point you're about to make, but you know, there's not enough proper serious Marxism. You know, kind of on the left. You know, kind of, and and it's about you know using glib, stupid words like neoliberalism to attack every, you know every, every everything. So <laughs> I don't think that's an academic problem. This is not about academia. This is about the the culture on a certain. Part of, in a certain part of the left, and, and it's, it's fueled by social media. So that's, that's one thing, and I think that it's up to us on the left to challenge that, I think. Um, I think, um, I think there's, a, there's another problem, though, which universities can do something about, which is that we don't talk to each other. You know, we don't, um, I don't think the problem is a lack of diversity. The problem is kind of ghettoization, the fact that we're all penned in, in our little worlds, um, you know, kind of war studies, uh, you know, um, Trotskyism, whatever, you know, and, and, and we've, we've, we've come so narrow down in our sub-disciplines, and the dynamics of British higher education, unlike the US, um, the, re the REF, you know, kind of the TEF, all these different kind of sort of uh, governance frameworks kind of that are very much about disciplines governing themselves, institutionalizing that disciplinary perspective. That doesn't, isn't good for um, encouraging debate and dialogue between different perspectives, you know, kind of, and I think that's what, that's what we need to do something about to, to challenge. We need to have classrooms in which students with different perspectives are talking to each other. Um, we need to have, you know, academics teaching with each other from different perspectives. Um, um, for me, I think it's the, I think the students want this stuff. My experience is not of students. Uh, th there is a, a minority of, you know, idiot left students kind of who do this kind of thing, you know, um, and, you know, and, uh, you know, there are a lot of non, not idiot left students who, who I think would take a different view too. But um, but I think in general students are kind of are, are you know up, are up for diversity, are up for conflict, or up for kind of you know th that, those kind of arguments. And I, and I worry sometimes it's the ac it's academics who are not because they don't want to see, want debate, but because they don't have the confidence. They worry. Um, they're they're sort of overly concerned. You know they're on short term contracts, whatever it is. You know kind of so 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 in a sense we need to be encouraging academics to have the confidence to to have you know to be controversial, to debate, to argue. Um, so. Another kind of thing happened that happened in King, Kings, as well as um, this uh, role I have, I, I'm the college-wide sort of academic lead for sort of interdisciplinarity, and we're thinking about you know ways in which we can encourage kind of interdisciplinary teaching. Um, and we just had a kind of a module competition where we we asked um, you know any academic to put in a bid for you know kind of a mod modules that have to be taught by people from different disciplines kind of together. And the, and the applications were incredible, and they demonstrate the appetite for something in universities that that kills kind of the, 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 the ghettoization I'm talking about. One of the best, and we will, you know, I, I'm really looking forward to this, was a, is a module jointly taught between med medicine and, um, you know, humanities academics, feminist academics, about sexuality and gender, that has the conversation about is, you know, is, is, is sex biological, is gender, you know, uh, is gender culturally defined. Get people, from, you know, having people from different perspectives, get them in a room and have that, have that debate. It, you know, left-wing kind of feminist academics want to have that, you know, conversation with medics who take a very different view. You know, so there's a kind of there's a real appetite there for, for that kind of that kind of conversation um, that I think we need to tap into and and, and develop and, and push on push on with. Um, I worry a bit. So this is my final um, two final fi final comments. Um, I worry a bit that actually some of the kind of some of this uh, conversation, if you like, is almost corroborating the point that you're trying to criticise, and that. Actually, I see really re resilient, to use that word, um, you know, anti-fragile students who are really sceptical about what I tell them, you know, kind of, uh, you know, who challenge me, 
who are happy, you know, kind of challenging me, um, you know, who um, come to university with a set of political views, mostly which are more right-wing than those of the academics, and leave with the same views. They don't, you know, but they're better at articulating them. You know, my best students are, you know, conservative MPs, you know, kind of like a very senior military officer who um, has shifted slightly leftward, but, you know, not that much, you know, kind of, uh, you know, um, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, you know, people working in the you know toy party, whatever. You know, kind of. There's there's a there's a breadth there um, that you know I've empowered them to do to do their terrible nefarious right wing you know thing. But they haven't. You know, I haven't. I I haven't kind of. You know, to to assume somehow that me as a lefty academic I'm able to kind of you know change their basic world view is incredible arrogance. And I think that that's there's a little bit of that going on. Here, that we sort of we sort of imagine that the students that we're teaching are this are the kind of fragile creatures that occasionally they they, um, you know, kind of uh, uh, describe themselves that. And I, I don't think that's the case. I think that they are, um, you know, tough, resilient creatures who, you know, much of the time, you know, kind of, who, uh, you know, sort of, who can cope with the kind of rough and tumble of, of you know, debate and argument. And, and that's a lot of the time what university pr provides them. Okay, can everyone hear me? Great. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm also a professor in the UK, originally from Canada. I'm going to just say something brief about the UK first, and then I'm going to talk more generally uh, uh, some points to, with regards uh, to John's thesis. But just in the UK, just in the last month, and there are those in the room who are, who are in the same, um, the same boat with me, um, I was involved, well, I'm going to be involved in a talk on the 6th of December, uh, which was sort of protested and led to an open letter where hundreds of academics, a number of whom are at my university and people I see in committee meetings, uh, signed this open letter. And so that was kind of an eye opener. But then also the stuff that was happening on Twitter media, the attempt to get me in trouble with my university and in, you know, all of these things, I didn't realize that there was this kind of dark underbelly of, of academics, you know, far left academics kind of styling themselves anti-fascist allied with radical students. And I think it's, that is the pernicious network that we need to somehow control. The mass of uh, my academic colleagues are fantastic. Yes, they're mostly on the left, uh, but they do not sort of fall in with these people. So I think we have to make that distinction. How do we control? Who, how do we police the virtue police? How do we police these people who, who want to call everything hate uh, and then want to make the lives of anyone who steps out of line miserable? That's the task I think we need to focus on. I, I just want to talk more generally, though, about uh, John's argument. And I, I completely agree with his book. I'm a huge supporter. I'm a member of Heterodox Academy and all that. Um, I guess my the difference I have is more that I think ideology is in the driver's seat. And I think psychology is, to some extent, just a tool or just an idiom that the underlying driver is a post-1960s ideology, the turn of the left. And so I think what's changed is more a matter of quantity than quality. I mean, you can look at a number of incidents, and I have these in my book. 1968, San Francisco State University. Black students take over the university administration, demand 20 black studies posts, 10 ethnic studies posts. They strike for a year. They want a Black Panther member who assaulted the student newspaper editor to be set. I mean, Actually, stuff which is probably above and beyond even what we've seen recently. 1975, the, uh, David, or James Coleman, a famous sociologist, is giving a speech about how busing is leading to white flight. People are on stage waving, waving racist placards. And, and you, so you see a lot of the same things. It's just maybe not as frequent. The 80s and 90s, and of course, we're kind of the third wave of political correctness. You know, the first wave, it was, it was people like Daniel Bell and, and uh, you know, the original neoconservatives were writing against it. Then you had um, Alan Bloom closing of the American mind. And what he was talking about, I think we're seeing a different iteration of that. But I see it as part of the same set of ideas. It's a bit like religious fundamentalism in the US. You had the tent revivalists in the, in the late 19th century. Drink was the big crusade in the 1920s. And then it became abortion. So there are these different waves. You've got the Great Awakenings. Um, you've got the moral majority. You have these different upsurges. And I think we see that also with political correctness and the new left. And we're in one of those right now. But I would say the underlying ideology is the problem. And, and that ideology is, number one, sacralization of group equality and diversity as sacred values which must be pushed to their extreme. No, you cannot argue against these sacred values. Second, an anti-intellectual emotional style occupation and protest rather than discussion and evidence. 
opposition to quantitative, any kind of generalization. And third, a focus on totemic categories, race, sex, and gender. That was certainly there in the 80s and 90s. Even though the buzzwords have changed, we're, yes, we're talking about fragility. We're talking about you know, therapeutic lingo, and, and we're talking about um, uh, microaggressions and so on. I still think the underlying dri drivers, the religion, as with religious fundamentalism, it, yes, there are the great awakenings, but underneath it all lies a problematic ideology which needs to somehow be pushed back towards a more moderate point of view, much as occurred, by the way, with socialism, which is now moderate in a social democracy. The cultural form of the left has not been checked. It's sort of out of control in many ways in the high culture. Um, and I would just say, in terms of the psychology, I mean, we don't see white people, males, uh, evangelicals, or Mormon, Mormons calling for safe spaces or getting them. Um, so I'm not sure that this psychological argument will, will I mean, I, I agree with John. This has interacted in a way and made it worse. But I think the driver is, is a, is a post-1960s ideology, and that more than anything else. And the, other, the last point I'm going to make, which is germane to my book, which is that in softer and milder form, this ideology has permeated into some of the elite institutions, the political and economic institutions. So for example, one of the drivers of the populist right, particularly in the United States, but also in Sweden and Germany, was an inability to have a conversation about immigration levels. And one of the reasons for that is that racism in particular, the meaning of racism expanded to include discussing immigration, particularly in the US case, reducing legal levels of immigration or talking about illegal immigration as your central campaign issue. Trump was the only one of 17 Republican primary candidates that was able to do that, which is why, and the data's all in the book, it's very clear that's why he won the primary. So the fact that you had a taboo over discussing immigration, which was pushed ultimately by this new left ideology, which in softer form had bled into the political discussion, shut down a debate over immigration. Now, if you shut that down in the mainstream, the only people that can supply what those voters demand are populist entrepreneurs. Exact same thing in Sweden. 2013, the interior minister tried to raise this question of immigration levels, was accused of being racist by the mainstream parties and media. What happens? Sweden Democrats come in in 2014 with 12.5%, and then they, they at some point reached 25%. So nobody is willing to talk about it. Who's going to talk about it? A populist entrepreneur. No one's willing to supply liquor. Who's going to supply it? A bootlegger. So uh, the, the consequences of this is not just on campus, but I think the consequences extend to uh, explaining the rise of right-wing populism as well. Great. Um, OK, well, um, we're, we're running over a bit, but I mean, I think we can, uh, we can extend the conversation a bit longer, because um, I want to bring, um, bring people in in a sec. But I just want to... John, did you want to just kind of briefly respond to? Well, yeah, I'd love to make a few comments. There's so many good things said. I think right. I can add to a few of the things. I'll try to be very brief. Right. Um, uh, Joanna's letter was absolutely priceless. And at first, I was thinking it's the most perfect specimen, but it's not. They didn't call you a fascist or a racist, did they? <laughs> well, they implied it. They strongly implied it. OK. But go back and tell them to clean that up. They can, they can do better. Um, Let's see. Uh, secondly, uh, Ken is your yeah, name? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Ken, I, I agree. The imitation and the herd. <clears throat> we, <clears throat> if you suddenly increase the degree to which people are connected by a factor of 100 over just a few years, yes, we are seeing massive herd imitation behaviors, especially in the young. I agree with that point. Um, you and Eric both questioned whether really this was a mental illness thing or was that just sort of a cover for a truly ideological point. You're right that ideology does drive a lot of it. And often people aren't saying, I am fragile. They're saying, she is fragile. I'm standing up for her. So I do agree ideology is a big part of this. Um, uh, I also agree with the point that, uh, I'm sorry, what's your name again? John. John. The point that John made that the, stu that the faculty are not actually indoctrinating the students. I would have thought that they are, but there is evidence. You're right. There is evidence that students aren't really that much affected by their professors. They're affected much more by their peers. So we have to really keep our eye on that. Um, but on the point about whether the, the, the big rise in mental illness is not really a major causal factor, remember that the, the, when you have depressed students on campus, 
what they do all day long is catastrophize black and white thinking, labeling, blaming. I mean, in, uh, in Joanna's letter, I saw almost every cognitive distortion. Also, there's new research, or research I found, I didn't show it, that when students are depressed in class, they show more rigid thinking. They jump to more negative conclusions, and you can't shake them off it. So on the question is, you know, I was, I was in a debate recently, you know, people, with people saying, you know, everything is racist, everything. Uh, every institution, every person. I mean, you, s you start with a very negative view, and you cannot be shaken from that. If you suddenly have 5% of your students have that way of looking at it, and it's very difficult for anyone to stand up to them, that changes discussion quite a lot. Um, let's see. On John's point, um, oh, different diversities. A very important point, yes. I, I've talked mostly about political diversity, but you're right. The, the real thing we want is we want our students to be comfortable taking multiple lenses. It doesn't have to be left versus right. Multiple lenses. That's what a great education is. The worst thing we do on some campuses, students who choose to major in the grievance studies, we call it, they learn one lens. Everything is through the lens of one lens, that power, you know, power and privilege versus victimhood and oppression Life is a zero-sum battle for a fixed pie, and there's the good people and the bad people. I do think that while there's probably not a major school in which most students have just that one lens, but this is not a story about most students. This is a story about a small number of students at every school that do use just one lens to look at everything. They are badly educated, and most importantly, they damage the education of everyone else. They're the reason for the call-out culture. They're the reason that other students are afraid to speak up uh, in class. Um, finally, uh, Eric's point. Um, yes, the point, the role of sacralization. This is, we are religious creatures. Human beings evolved to be religious. We make things sacred. We circle around them. Just look at what students do before a sports game. Look at how students initiate someone into a fraternity. We can't get religion out of our brains. So even if you're an atheist, you still have a religious brain. And this is showing up on campus in a lot of what we're seeing. It is religious action without an actual god. Um, and finally, the story that Eric told about populist entrepreneurs, I thought was brilliant. I, that's, I, that makes a lot of sense to me. You used the saying, you, you both talked about this sort of, there is a kind of a crazy left and a mostly reasonable left. Right, all of my colleagues at NYU, everyone's on the left and they're almost all liberal left, not illiberal. Um, but, it, but what happens when you lose that last bit of opposition, when there is nobody left to raise their hand and say, well, wait a second, then yes, you can get a crazy or illiberal left. And I think that's part of what's happened in the last few years. So thank you for these great comments and additions to, to my thinking. Thank you so much. OK. Well, let, let's have a few comments. Um, we'll, 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 we'll overrun by 10 or 15 minutes. Um, and no one will mind, I hope. Um, um, yep, lady there, Claire. Um, uh, yeah, Claire Fox, re really fascinating, everyone. Um, the. Sorry? The, uh, the thing I wanted to, to, to note is that over the last couple of years, um, since I wrote a, a very modest little book, um, uh, partly inspired by the Coddling of the American Mind essay, actually, um, was that um, when I go to universities now, where I constantly go to speak, if I'm not kind of put off or deplatformed, um, is that many students will gather around and say, um, we can't stand the, the, the stultifying atmosphere on campus. And I think that what we would underestimate is if we think it's all the kind of egregious headline-making free speech issues, but the walking on eggshells is felt by many students, and they want to know what to do about it. One of the things which they will note, by the way, is, is that their academic lecturers are no help. I mean, the people who are most outraged by the Enlightenment as any kind of a progressive thought are often the academics. Um, you know, you wouldn't want to mention the word Brexit. Um, you certainly are not going to be able to say certain things. So for those students who are kind of open-minded, there's an atmosphere and everything is racialized. And so you'll find that people are just frightened to say the wrong thing, stick to themselves. So they'll say, what can we do? So that's just one thing. The second thing is, I think there is a link between this and the mental health issue. I have some sympathy with Joanna's point that I don't know, John, whether there isn't a danger of you catastrophizing the mental health crisis because there is a lot of self-reporting. And everywhere I go, young people are saying, but, you know, we demand more mental health services. We demand everything is seen through the prism of their own pathology. But it is the case that every free speech issue is dressed up in the same language, trigger warnings. You've got to ban somebody from speaking because it creates PTSD. 
there's going to be a, a sort of traumatic response, psychological harm, of speaking. So these things are intimately uh, linked. I think that the young people are being preloaded at schools that is full of this stuff, and it starts very much younger than at the universities and just expresses itself through the safe space movement when they get there. And the academics are only too f uh, happy to see that because they're kind of using these young people to ventriloquize their own political prejudices themselves. Okay, I, I, I'm just going to take a few more comments and questions. A, a guy in glasses there, near the front. And you can all just, sort of at the end, just respond yeah. once to whatever okay. you want to respond to. Yeah. Thanks. <clears throat> uh, my name is Piers Baird, and I <clears throat> lecture in philosophy. Um, I sympathize with the Heterodox Academy. I think it's a brilliant initiative. But uh, I like counterexamples and counterarguments, so I'll just present one to you. Wonderful. Somebody's obviously going to say, look, when it comes to diversity of opinion in the Academy, no one thinks there should be more racists teaching political science. No one thinks there should be more creationists teaching biology. So it's a pretty good thing that we don't have diversity in those areas. So why should we have, they will say, right-wingers or uh, conservatives and so on, teaching, uh, teaching young minds ideas that are false? Now, the obvious argument against that is going to be, the issue is not what you think, it's how you think. So what's really wrong with creationists and racists and anti-Semites and so on is that they think in a twisted way. There's no way you can argue with them in the end because everything you say, uh, I mean, th th they have a, a built-in immunity to falsification and refutation in what they say. But now the problem is, with the kind of people you are quite rightly criticizing, I, I doubt the extent of their influence in the academy, but they certainly exist. The real problem with them, especially with people who say, ah, oh, that's just the Enlightenment, is that they themselves are now built into their thinking a kind of um, invulnerability. So there's nothing you can say to them that's going to be convincing. Given that, the, given that so, what's the best way to argue with the people that we are disagreeing with is in, in, this, um, in this discussion? Um, uh, OK. Um, guy right at the back. Uh, good evening. Um, my name is Will, and I work with uh, Humanists UK and also a charity called Karma Nirvana that work with uh, victims of honour-based violence. And I run a programme for Humanists UK called Faith to Faithless that uh, talks about ap issues of apostasy in uh, universities. And what we found is that there's a huge apathy here in Britain, and I think this trend that you talked about in America, I think we're probably a lot closer uh, than two years. Um, people don't want to hear about this subject as, as, as much as they perhaps should. Um, um, okay, Mark. Very brief, but I think in terms of fighting back against this phenomenon, which you, you raised as uh, uh, something we, we need to do, the first stage of that is to use their term, we have to call out this phenomenon, and we have to stop calling them liberals. These people are not liberals, and we have to say that uh, they embody two fundamental ideas. One, as Ken mentioned, is a sort of almost 1930s uh, will to power paradigm uh, whereby they see politics as a group-based struggle in which individuals have no fundamental rights. Uh, and the second aspect, and this is why they hate the Enlightenment, is that they are anti-humanist. Um, they do not believe that individuals have agency, and therefore they use that axiom to justify suppressing speech, because then you can argue that words themselves become a form of, of deterministic uh, violence. So the first step is to establish that this is not a liberal, in fact, this is an anti-liberal phenomenon. Mm. Uh, <laughs> David, I think our short-term memory is being totally yeah. overloaded. Could we, could we make a few responses? Oh, okay, all right. Can I, can I just say, I, I, I can't tell you how much I agree with you about that, um, about, about the extent to which this is an illiberal position. And, I, and I, I'm reminded of, um, some of you may have read Mark Lilla's mm -hmm. um, polemic, in which he makes a, a, a I mean, I consider my, I'm left of center, and I think that this, this descent into, into atomized identity politics, which this is, which is part of the, the symptom of what you're talking about, or part of the cause, perhaps. Is, it, he, he's absolutely right when he says it's intensely damaging to the left and intensely damaging to liberalism. What it's doing, in, 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 his, in, his, uh, in his view, and I completely agree with him, it, it, is it means that these people have completely lost any sense of the, share, of the power of shared citizenship, which has been a kind of leftist concept through the, through the generations, that, that peop people come together in solidarity organizations 
citizenship is shared, and that brings its own power and its own movement and the possibility of political change. And, and, and this atomization is incredibly damaging to the left in, in the states and to liberalism, and it, and it will be here if it takes hold. I would also say to the, the lady who spoke, I, I think we'd be careful not to exaggerate this, however. I, I think that the number of students who think this way in British universities, certainly my university, are a very small minority. Um, they, te they can sometimes dominate student union meetings, and they do sometimes do d d intimidate uh, students who think more rationally from speaking out, but they don't, um, it seems to me, yet control the agenda in the way that you suggest, and I, and I slightly doubt they will. And I, and I think the sympathy for, for students in this category and for the these sorts of thought processes in faculties is very limited indeed. Certainly in my university, it's very limited. I'm I mean, I can't think of a single colleague in Oxford who... Yeah, oh, that's true. That is true. That, that's, a, that's a point. That's, that's one, that was one exception that I was going to make in the history faculty. That's true. But I don't, but I don't, but I think that is, is, is somewhat on a par with the letter that you were talking about. It's a kind of form of posturing that, that really, I'm not sure, speaks of any power within the institution. Can we, can John, we, John, you better come sorry, back I, on that. Because you were involved in the bigger. Yeah, I, so I'm, I'm, I'm one of the people whipping up the petitions of protest yeah. in this context. So, and I, and I, so I, I was one of the five initial, and this is a. I'll tell the full story, um, a bit of a, a, a revelation here. But, um, uh, so the, Nigel Bigger has this, is, is a, is a um, professor of moral theology, um, conservative professor of moral theology at Oxford, um, and has a project on the ethics of empire, which is, um, you know, kind of, which was um, a, a series of closed seminars um, about, um, you know, kind of, ba you know, doing, doing a kind of moral balance sheet of empire, et cetera, with, with, a, with a very small number of historians involved. And I, and I, and Oxford uh, University ended up doing a kind of press statement about how marvellous it was. And, and, and I and five other uh, kind of historians from outside Oxford um, wrote, a wrote a letter to Oxford, a public letter, saying um, that we objected to that statement from Oxford because this, I mean, the point behind the letter was um, this, this doesn't refle reflect the kind of the, the breadth of view that exists amongst historians about the, the British Empire, and that we want to have a proper, proper debate. And kind of Nigel Bigger's project actually was the one that was closing down um, perspe a perspective on that. Um, and you know, so uh, and N Nigel Bigger and I are going to be debating. You know, kind of uh, some point in. Um, so I also wrote to him and said, "Can we meet and talk about this? And it'd be great to have a co proper conversation with you about your views. I disagree with you, etc." Uh, and we're, we're going to be, you know, having a, a, a kind of debate about this at some point. He's going to be debating my book, um, you know, at some point next year, which is great. So, so, so that's the context there. So sometimes actually, you're and, and, and what the, the reason why we uh, wrote that letter um, was that we had no voice. We were silenced. There are scholars who have diverse views about empire um, who had no access to the media, you know, who had in a way that someone like Nigel Bigger did. And he had, you know, pieces in the Times, pieces in the Daily Mail saying, you know, kind of, British Empire was great, you know, all these lefties can, can go, go away. And, and there was no place where we could get, you know, no, actually, I want to challenge that, you know. Couldn't even get it in The Guardian. So hence, you know, actually a letter from 200 academics in the end who signed it saying, to, protesting to Oxford University saying, this perspective is not the only view on empire. That was, that, that's, that's what's going on with, Ni mm. with Nigel Bigger. Okay. Nothing more complicated than that. All right. Do, do you want to yeah, just to uh, come back on a few of those things and try and make sense of what's going on here. I, I absolutely agree that the number of students who are signing petitions, the number of academics who are writing letters um, is tiny proportion of all the students at the university uh, or the lecturers at the university but the problem is I think they have a disproportionate impact because of the moral righteousness um, that they adopt and the assumption that they have the moral high ground and when words like violence and harm and suicide and uh, trauma start being thrown around it allows these students and these academics to adopt such a, a moral um, position that and it makes anybody else speaking out in opposition to feel very intimidated. If you are accused of, of acts of violence in your words, then you think twice before you open your mouth. And this is why I completely recognize from my own experiences in higher education and conversations with students, um, this idea of the campus as being stultifying, of people walking on eggshells. I don't think academics are indoctrinating students. I think that gives them far too much power if we suggest that's the case. But the problem is what academics are not doing often, and there are a few very honorable exceptions, some of him are in the room this evening, what academics are generally not doing 
doing is standing up for free speech. So when students take these morally righteous positions about transphobia, misogyny, racism, fascism, violence, etc., etc., academics are all too ready to kowtow and say, you'd like us to issue an apology. OK, how exactly shall we word this apology? Um, the other problem, I think, that's really prevalent among academics at the moment, and again, it's a small group of academics who actually completely the opposite go out of their way to deny that there's any problem with free speech, will point out the technicalities. Oh, but your debate did go ahead as planned. And I think this really fails to recognize that there's one, more than one way to, um, to, to enculturate, uh, to, to threaten free speech on campus. There's more than one way to close down debate and discussion. Uh, we can all kind of point to extreme examples and say, oh, these extreme examples are so, so rare. We've got nothing to worry about. But a broader cultural challenge to free speech, I think, is something we fail to recognize at our peril. I think the problem um, in general is the dominance of identity politics within the academy, and, and most particularly, the way identity politics trades off offence. Offence becomes a currency. The more offended and outraged you are, uh, the more you get to take the moral high ground. I'll, 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 I'll just... Uh, quick... Uh, well, er Eric well, and then John. Well, yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, I didn't, I didn't read your letter, so I don't know what it said, but certainly the letter that was written in response to Claire and, and myself and Matt Goodwin and so on. The problem I have is that the way the argument is framed is usually one of manipulating norms because norms are meant to we're, we're meant to be disgusted if you break a norm like you urinate in this room in front of everybody that's a very dishonest way of arguing and that's typically what a lot of these letter writers are doing is they're trying to manipulate norms rather than have an, a debate based on evidence and, and that just very quickly ties into this point about falsification so the charge that you are normalizing or mainstreaming hate which was made against us has not a shred of yeah. academic empirical evidence and so this inability to, to measure this thing that we can falsify mm. so they constantly throw out unfalsifiable mysterious conspiracies yeah. that are going on anyway mm. uh, so very briefly to respond to the question of do we need more Nazis uh, viewpoint, <laughs> so viewpoint diversity does not mean we need everybody. It doesn't mean we need every possible viewpoint. It means we're always sensitive to when there's one, when there's an orthodoxy, when there is a, a consensus that cannot be challenged. You should be able to challenge a consensus if you have evidence. Um, so that's really what we're focused on, is not including everybody. It's just making sure that we don't narrow down to one, because people tend to do that, to have orthodoxy. Um, secondly, I had a major insight when I, I, I spoke at a, at a college in Alabama, Auburn University in Alabama. Um, I've mostly spoken at more prestigious universities when I'm giving talks. Um, but I went, I taught, and in Alabama, you'd expect there's a lot more racism than, say, at Yale or Middlebury in Vermont. But I had a talk I brought in by the chief diversity officer. And I talked with a group of black and white students. And it seemed like the problem there was rather minimal. And I realized, my god. These people are really polite. <laughs> They're Southerners. Mm -hmm. and these problems don't happen much in the South because people are polite. And what I realized is the culture that is being bred, this sub, and we all agree it's a subculture, the culture that's being bred is incredibly rude. That is, let's start by assuming the worst about everybody. Don't give anyone the benefit of the doubt. Don't give them the benefit of responding. Don't, uh, and the nature of the attacks on people are, as several have said, it's never an actual argument. I've been writing on this topic for three years. Nobody, practically nobody, has made an argument that I am wrong. Rather, it's just dozens and dozens and dozens of ad hominem arguments, guilt by association, linkage that I'm whistling at or winking at racists or whatever. If they would make an argument, we could have a debate, but they never make an argument. And this is the way that we've failed them. In universities, we need to stand up, as several points out, the faculty need to stand up and say, well, OK, I, I appreciate the sentiment behind that, but if you want to attack this person or critique the person, please focus on what they're saying. Learn to disprove their arguments. You'll be much more effective. And that's also what Mark Lillis said, that the left yeah, is exactly. neutering itself by allowing young lefty students to learn that this is the way you fight. They're neutering themselves. And by the way, members of, of the Columbia, Columbia University faculty accused him of being an apologist for white supremacism. Yes. Mm. OK, well, let's just uh, t take two or three more, and then we, we will have to wind up. Um, the lady at the front um, has been waiting patiently. Just, I'm not an academic at all, so, but just listening to you um, and thinking about that is what do you think the academy has in relationship to 
democracy and what are you trying to do with your students? And it, and it struck me, Jonathan, when you were talking about the complexity of issues, and sometimes it seems to be like academics are saying it, issues are so complex, particularly social science academics, that actually the demos uh, don't have an ability to understand and grasp that, and, and the experts are the ones who know it, and, and, and does that create this intemperate climate? And particularly, Eric, I'm thinking about the letter that came against you and Claire and so forth, when the group of academics were saying, we know what the answer is in society. It's just the democratic deficit and there should be some housing and economics. So how dare anyone discuss is immigration a problem or um, you know, Eastern, you know, whatever you were discussing. So they actually just said, we understand the answer. You shouldn't be allowed to ask that okay, question. Okay. Is that the problem? Okay, quick, quick, quick. Okay, hand, hand, the, hand the mic forward. Thank you very much. Quick one, please. Thanks. Uh, yeah, Stuart Ritchie, uh, King's College London. Um, also, um, I, I completely agree with the, uh, the the university's aspect of what you've been talking about and the the, the student aspects. But I think uh, I'll just provide a, a, an alternative uh, perspective or, or opposing perspective. I think the weak link is the mental health stuff. And um, there was a report today from the NHS uh, in in England showing that actual um, levels of mental health problems have, I think, increased from 10% in 2004 to 11% uh, in 2017, in the, in, that's just in England, and that's among 5 to 15 year olds, um, so it's younger than that include depression? If students. you just look at depression, what happens? Um, I think slight increase and a slight oh. decrease in conduct uh, problems, so it's kind of oh, okay. balancing out. And I think if the social media hypothesis was true, I think you would see a stronger increase. So I, I don't mean to ambush you with data that literally came out today, but I think I think there is okay, there, so that's the weak link in the chain. Anyway. Yes. Okay, <laughs> go, go, um, okay. Uh, Thomas, Guy and Glass is there. Very quick. I am um, just very interested by the suddenness of the whole thing. That was fascinating to me. And the three years. So what's the etiology of this? We've, we've talked some factors, but it just seems that it's the same thing with trans activism. How does this happen so quickly? The T has been there on the end of LGBT for a long, long time there must be more going on than, than single monocausal explanations. I would just be interested to hear your mm. thoughts. Mm. Uh, and the guy in the red at the back, actually, well, while you're taking the microphone, him, well, what about the whole argument about family size? I mean, I that, that's obviously something that's happened over a much longer period of time. I mean, I'm one of seven, and I think I'm pretty resilient because I was kicked <laughs> around as a child. My children are one of four, and they're much snowflakier than I was. <laughs> Anyway, you can, you can answer that later. <laughs> I, I'm, and I'm, I'm just interested what it's like, I, I work at Policy Exchange with David. Um, to what extent is this confined to the academy? Uh, today is Thanksgiving, and last week I was at the Mayflower uh, Museum in Plymouth in Massachusetts, and I was struck, they had various gobbets of the pilgrims describing their encounters with the Native American uh, people. Um, and above it, the, there were trigger warnings. To what extent do you think that this concern you have has become uh, in the wider intellectual and academic community beyond the university itself. Okay, l l um, we'll do the last one. Well, okay, last Respond. one. And well, two Tobies, <laughs> two Tobies can very briefly speak. Come on. Uh, Toby, my dear, I work in book publishing. I wonder if this isn't sort of a sign of left liberal decline, actually. Um, I remember being a postgraduate student at the University of London in the late 80s and being the only person in the room who thought a fatwa against Salman Rushdie was a really terrible idea. Um, uh, E.O. Wilson's, e. Wilson's lectures were, or were picketed in the early 70s. Um, in, in fact, of course, in the 80s, the left won all the cultural arguments and lost all the economic arguments. Um, and now, in the absence of politics and the absence of economics and political economy, what you're left with is a sort of theology, and perhaps your students in <coughs> Alabama were more polite because they were more religious. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, just to speak to China's point first, which was... Um, uh, you were introducing a series of talks called Endangered Spe Speeches at uh, KCL, and um, Eric and I were due to speak in that series, but we were notified today that our talk has been cancelled because of the negative publicity that your introduction attracted. <laughs> and as far as I know, the only negative publicity was that letter that you read out. So they've effectively achieved their objective, not in your case, but in the case of Eric and I. Um, I just wanted to make the point in response to uh, Jonathan's presentation, which I thought was fantastic. I'm a huge fan, Heterodox Academy brilliant initiative. Um, but I do think, uh, just to emphasise what you just said and what Eric said too, that what's wrong with your analysis is that this phenomenon is not confined to the academy and it's not confined to Gen I, I think you call them. Um, so we just see countless examples of it elsewhere, not just in museums, but in the performing arts. Um, we see it in the tech giants. We see it 
uh, in the social media companies, making life difficult for right of center organizations like PragerU. We saw it with the defenestration of Ian Baruma at the New York Review of Books. And it, okay, it was driven by the millennials on staff, as was the New Yorker's decision to rescind the invitation to Steve Bannon. But you know, they're millennials, they're not Gen I. It seems to be more like, uh, and I think you've said this yourself, a religion, um, as Eric said, a great awakening, the great awokening, if you like. <laughs> and, and, and it should be, and, and, and we need to understand why this uh, great awakening is taking place, not just in universities and not just amongst this generation, but seemingly across the whole of the culture in the Anglosphere. Well, that's a good question to end on. Perhaps, do you all want to just say a final word and, and John can finish at the end? Mm -hmm. Mind sure. you uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I thought the point at the back there about is this confined to the academy is, is a very good point. I, I think it's clearly not confined to the academy. It's migrated well beyond the university. And you can see how even the language, so you talked about trigger warnings on, on pictures, but we, um, well, not we, but the, the BBC, for example, is routinely accused of, of platforming voices and opinions and views uh, of, of, of people who are seen as being controversial. So there are calls to no platform, for the, that the BBC should essentially no platform guests. Uh, we've seen people who get appointed to public offices in, in recent weeks, Roger Scruton, Toby Young at the back there, uh, who then have their entire past history mined for possible offensive things they may or may not have said at one point to, to uh, have these things thrown up for public scrutiny, again, with a view to having them removed from public life. Uh, so I think you know this has gone way beyond universities. Uh, to me, I think, again, I would always put it in the political rather than in the psychological. And I think it's worth bearing in mind that until very, very recently, until Trump, until Brexit, our concern was not about polarization of debate, but our concern when we talked about politics was about the um, convergence of political opinion. We talked about beyond left and right. Uh, Giddens raised the issue of the third way. Uh, we were talking about there being fewer differences between <coughs> the political parties. Um, and what seemed to replace these significant ideological differences between left and right, obviously, and like I said, this is a, up until a couple of years ago, uh, were gender, race. So now it's quite acceptable for an article to appear in The Guardian, for example, um, after the midterms in the US, that has the headline, what is wrong with with white women, kind of castigating white women in America uh, for voting for Trump, as if all white women are one completely homogenous block who think in exactly the same way and are so stupid that they just do what their <laughs> husbands or fathers instruct them to do. And I think that that focus on race, gender, sexuality has really become entrenched. And like I said, the way you take the moral high ground in this debate is by claiming victim status for your particular identity group. And, and I think this is really what we do see playing out on campus, but also in broader society. I just want to say very, very quickly, very, very quick final point on the political diversity, the topic of this evening. I, I share some of the concerns that were raised um, from the floor here. I am um, obviously I'm no fan and I, I share your concerns as well when we have political homogeneity. I agree it can lead to all kinds of problems, but I'm very, very wary about what we might put in place to rectify this problem. Um, the idea that we might have quotas, for example, you know, to have a, a particular number of different political viewpoints represented, or the idea that people might be asked at job interviews, how did you vote in the last election, kind of fills me with horror, and there's a danger of returning to a, a kind of form of McCarthy if we go down that line. And, and also, uh, you know, to go back to what I was saying about the convergence of left and right that we'd seen up until relatively recently, you know, uh, just because somebody says they voted Labour or voted Conservative doesn't necessarily imply that there is a whole heap of political differences between the two. I think instead what we need is much more of a tolerance and an open-mindedness and a willingness to debate uh, and confront challenging ideas, which are many of the points that you're raising in your book. John Quickwood. Just very quickly, I, so I, I think I'm saying that I don't, I don't think this is a, a problem to do with the universities. I think it's about um, a certain kind of left culture and social, which is um, exacerbated by social media. And I think Eric's got hit the nail on the head in terms of thinking about a certain kind of 1960s leftism that is actually fetishizes violence, and that's essential. This is what Hannah Arendt was writing against in, on violence in 
1968, and, and it was still there. And, and that's, so, so that's part of this. But, but the kind of broader kind of, there's a way in which, you know, the, the broader kind of victim culture has, has gone beyond that. And I, I sort of, I see people on the right using that language when they're, um, obviously not you, but, you know, when they're kind of uh, supposedly silent. And I think there's a kind of, a paradox, I mean, Nigel Bigger, you know, uses that kind of language. So, so there's a sort of like, there is a kind of escalation in which both sides are claiming, you know, that they're being, you know, kind of silenced by the other. And I think that's terrible. And we need, you know, you know so sometimes things are uncomfortable and, and you know, we, need, we need to be able to put up with that, um, you know, sometimes. So, so I think there's a kind of, pr sometimes a pr preciousness around free speech. You know, we need to protect free, free speech, but it's kind of messy, you know. So, so we, we, you know, kind of, I, so I worry that that kind of protect protectiveness sometimes articulates exactly the kind of arguments that, you're trying mm, to oppose. Yeah. So, so um, I think um, <coughs> I think that uh, I think actually that one answer is to talk to people and listen to people and actually sit down and, and challenge just face to face. And, and that's you know kind of something that we you know we, we need to do when you have people who are making these points. Just just engage. You know, and actually find out what they mean. Often, often you know that kind of like friendly. What do you mean by that? You know, there's nothing behind it. You know, kind of there's there's a there's a kind of shoutiness that you know kind of if you get, if you can be civil and and polite. And I don't I, I disagree with Ken. I don't think actually it is about. Uh, not, I'm not very keen on rudeness, you know, I, I think um, main, we should be civil and nice to each other. And I think just the final point about universities, actually, a lot of this is just really bad management that doesn't call out bullies, yes, people who are that's just right. bad. You know, I'm sorry, it's not that, 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 you know, you say, you know, it's not about bad people and good people, but, you know, sometimes people just are actually quite imp unpleasant in a work environment and they're bullies and they, ha and they happen mm -hmm. to be left wing and that gives them this whole self-righteousness. And they need to be called out and disciplined and, you know, something needs to happen and uh, that doesn't happen enough. enough. Uh, Eric, have, have any of your um, persecutors, uh, petition persecutors, said anything to your face from your from Berkeley? No, they haven't said anything to my face. Although there were people who were trying to get me privately to withdraw from this talk, so right. sort of to self deplatform. I guess that's how you'd put it. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> but um, no, just picking up on that. I mean, I think this is the key question. You know, how we, do we police the virtue police, the norm police? And I don't think any of us have yet figured out how we can do that. I mean, some kind of perhaps duty not to uh, sort of persecute by ideology within universities might be an answer, but I just don't know how that would work. Um, just to pick up on Toby Mundy's excellent point really about this, you know, the left won in the culture and lost economically. And I think uh, we kind of came to an arrangement economically. The big question is how are we going to come to an arrangement, an accommodation culturally? The the, the high culture is completely dominated by this post-1960s, which, by the way, has roots in the early part of the 20th century, and that's another story. But how do we actually push back uh, against, essentially, equality and diversity as sacred values? I mean, equality and diversity, fine, if they're evidence-based, and yes, absolutely. But in terms of sacred values, you cannot argue against. Who's going to make the argument against that in the high culture, I think, is the big question. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, it, I, I'm certain, and it's obvious that this, it, it, this is a problem far beyond um, the academy. And actually, it's a problem. It's a problem of the left primarily, um, not entirely, but but primarily. And I think I'm, I'm going to be a bit of a catastrophist and say that I, that I think I think this is really, really dangerous for the left at this point. And I, I think the, the sort of pathologies that we're talking about are dangerous to the left because they they they, they might make it impossible for left-wing parties to build winning uh, election coalitions. It may simply be impossible for the left, for the Democrats, to win in the United States if they... And, and the reason is, this behavior, these behaviors, are driving natural constituencies of the left rightwards, uh, and in particular, uh, in the direction of populism, uh, for all sorts of reasons which we could debate for a, a long, long time. But I think these, these pathologies are, have, have a, a role in that, that sort of uh, dis disintegration of naturally left-wing uh, winning uh, coalitions. And so I think for the left, this is a very, very serious problem. We, and, and the left shows no sign at all that I can see of grappling with it. It's either ignored by um, people who are running more or less respectable left-wing parties, uh, and what's ignored is that many of their activists are behaving precisely like this and alienating the people that they need to have support them if they're going to put together winning coalitions. And I think this is a very, very serious moment for the left. And I don't think the left generally, the establishment left, if you like, the establishment electoral left, has understood how to grapple with it, let alone how to deal with it. A final, final word for John. I mean, uh, without wanting to sound too catastrophist, I mean, <laughs> a, a, a lot of people do talk about a kind of new civil war you know, in, in more than just rhetorical terms now, particularly in the United States, and, 
and even you know the country breaking up in some way into into kind of you know blue state areas and red state areas. I mean, is that yes? I, I am one of those people who thinks that it is at least within the realm of possibility. I'm not saying that it's likely to happen, but things are now possible to imagine that were not possible just a few years ago. Uh, we don't know how we don't know what happens when you run a large, secular, diverse democracy with extremely low trust and a social media environment that foments distrust. We just don't know. That's never happened before. Um, I'll just make three points briefly to, to close up here. I think this is a wonderful set of comments. I agree with every single thing that everybody <laughs> said on in this last round. This was great. Um, I'll just put a bunch of couple things here and from the, from the audience. Uh, my first point about um, a couple of people noted that this is not just in the academy. Absolutely right. The, a lot of these ideas were nurtured in gender studies departments, a few other places, going back several decades. So it's not that they were just invented, but it's sort of like imagine you know you've got like uh, you know a bunch of books and they suddenly burst into flames. Well, it's because the temperature was rising and rising and rising, and then at a certain point it's ready for a flame, and that's what happened in 2014. Um, but the the some of the roots were go back a while, and it is quickly spreading out beyond the academy, as that gentleman noted, uh, trigger warnings at a museum, that's new to me, except that the New York Times had an article just two days ago that theaters, that, that we if you put on a play in the United States, now they're beginning to have trigger warnings. Um, and so it's very hard to stop the spread of that because once a few theaters do it, the rest are going to be afraid they'll be sued if someone has a panic attack. Um, so it is spreading very, very fast. I think that is worrisome because it creates the sense that everybody is fragile. We have to all look out for fragile people and that makes people more fragile. On the question of what do we do about it and the possibility of quotas, absolutely. We should, there's no, I would not, that would be counterproductive to have quotas. I'm in a field called social psychology. We've spent most of the last 40 years primarily dealing with the question of how do you increase inclusion? How do you increase representation from underrepresented minorities? Step one, stop the hostile climate. That's like, you know, there's no reason to have a hostile climate. Like, that's the easiest thing. And so uh, I've been trying to get professors to stop making jokes about how stupid and evil Republicans are when they're at the front of the classroom. Just stop it. There's no reason to do that. Uh, there's a lot we can do to encourage more people to come into higher to come into PhD programs. And also what I've discovered since running Heterodox Academy is that while there are hardly any people on the right, there are a lot of people who are not firmly on the left. We have a lot of diversity of centrist, libertarians, and very heterodox people. So the crucial thing is just that we not be all this. There's a lot of diversity that can be unlocked if they felt that it was safe, I suppose, to say things. My final point. Um, uh, is that in response to the question here about, well, you know, the elites act like they've got all the answers, but sometimes the common people have actually have more wisdom. And of course, populism is based on the idea that the common people, the good people, and the elites have lost touch. Um, uh, progress, insight, wisdom, these don't come because some individual is brilliant. We're all rather stupid. We're all really, really good at justifying what we already believe. Wisdom comes from putting stupid people together in the right way so that they can challenge each other and the truth emerges. That's what John Stuart Mill said. That's what Talmudic wisdom says. That's the idea of a jury. Um, it's when we get good social systems, then we advance. That's one of the great discoveries of the Enlightenment. And I especially thank the British Enlightenment and the Scottish Enlightenment. Thank God my country was founded by those principles, not French Enlightenment. <laughs> thank God my country was founded by Britain, not by Spain or France or Portugal. So Britain has played an enormous role in creating what I think is the best set of institutions to run countries over the last several hundred years. Uh, I'm sorry that our universities I'm have sure infected yours. We copied you to make our <laughs> universities. Now you're trying to create uh, diverse viewpoints. Like now get oh, it. no, me and Nigel Bigger, Bigger, I guess, we're going to get on the same side. All right, all right. We're then not going to go there. We're about, not going to go there. It's all about good systems. <clears throat> Let's fix <clears throat> the universities, and we can make progress together. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, we, we've overrun by almost three quarters of an hour, but you've been a very resilient and grown up <laughs> audience. Um, um, I want to thank Jonathan um, John for, um, for his ideas, for, for coming here, for speaking so eloquently. Um, and um, a very good way of thanking him would be to buy a copy of his book. Uh, there are, there's a pile at the back. There's also Eric Kaufman's book, White Shift. Um, so, um, but also let's, let's thank him and his four interrogators in the traditional way. Thank you very much. <laughs>